Morning, everyone. So the scripture passage for this morning is taken from 1 Samuel, chapter 13, verses 1 to 23. Saul lived for one year and then became king. And when he had reigned for two years over Israel, Saul chose 3,000 men of Israel. 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash and the hill country of Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan in Gabeah of Benjamin. The rest of the people he sent home, every man to his tent. Jonathan defeated the garrison of the Philistines that was at Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. And Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all of Israel heard it and said that Saul had defeated the garrison of the Philistines, and also that Israel had become a stench to the Philistines. And the people were called out to join Saul at Gilgal. And the Philistines mustered to fight with Israel 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and troops like the sand on the seashore in multitude. They came up and encamped in Michmash and to the east of Beth-Avon. When the men of Israel saw that they were in trouble, for the people were hard-pressed, they hid themselves in caves and in holes and in rocks and in tombs and in cisterns. And some Hebrews crossed the fords of the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. And Saul was still at Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. He waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from him. So Saul said, bring the burnt offering to here to me, and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. And as soon as he finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet and greet him. Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattering from me and that you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistines had mustered, up, mustered at Michmash, I said, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of your, the Lord your God with which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now... Your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. And Samuel arose and went up from Gilgal, and the rest of the people went up after Saul to meet the army. They went up from Gilgal to Gebeah of Benjamin. And Saul numbered the people who were present with him, about 600 men. And Saul and Jonathan, his son, and the people who were present with him, stayed in Geba of Benjamin. But the Philistines encamped at Michmash. And the raiders came out of the camp of the Philistines in three companies. One company turned to Ophrah, to the land of Shuel, Another company turned toward Beth Horon, and another company toward the border that looks down on the valley of Zeboam toward the wilderness. Now, there was no blacksmith to be found throughout the, all the land of Israel, for the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make themselves swords or spears. But every one of the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen his plowshare, his mattock, his axe, or his sickle. And the charge was two-thirds of a shekel for plowshares and for the mattocks, and a third of a shekel for sharpening the axes and for setting the goads. So on the day of the battle, there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people with Saul and Jonathan. But Saul and Jonathan, his son, had them. <laughs> 
and the garrison of the Philistines went out to the pass of Michmash. These are the true words of the living God. Hello, hello. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Good morning, RHC. How are you all? We good. Hey, morning. Yes, I got a response. Good. Um, my name's Chen. I'm one of the elders in the first congregation, um, and it's just a pleasure to be able to bring God's word to you this morning. Can I open us in prayer? And when you join me in prayer, Father, we just thank you for this morning, Lord. We we pray this morning that you would just help us behold you to look to you, to adore you, to make much of you. God, won't you occupy our hearts, our minds, our thoughts, that would look to your beauty, Jesus, that would be enraptured, captivated by who you are and what you have done for us. Be with us this morning, Lord God. In your name we pray. Amen. So as Leanne mentioned, today is the first day of Advent a time where we look back and we remember when Christ, Jesus, came into this world. But it's also a time where we look forward and we also anticipate his coming. And yet, as Lianan also alluded to, Christmas is a time where we can celebrate it. Arguably, the common practice is to celebrate it without any reference, without looking at Jesus at all. Christmas is a time where We get and we receive gifts, a time where we plan our holidays, a time where we get a break from school, a time where the office is a bit quieter, a time where perhaps we can um, spend time with family and friends. And these things, my friends, these things aren't bad. These things are not bad. They're good things. But we've got to ask ourselves, how did Christmas become a time where we look to ourselves instead of looking at God? Now, growing up, for me, I might surprise you to hear, I hated Christmas, but I have good reason for this. My birthday is December 28th, so you can note that down in your diary. If you want to take a note, note that down, my friends. And why, so why I hated Christmas was because friends, even family often, were too busy to spend time and celebrate my birthday with me. I know, thank you, thank you, thank you. (laughs) Thank you, guys. I love you guys. And so for me, right... Christmas, rather than being able to enjoy the festivities of the season, Christmas became a time which reminded me of my own insignificance. And I, I, I did not like it. And so, when we ask ourselves, why do we spend Christmas the way we do, often without looking at Jesus, actually the answer behind that can also be found in my same disdain for Christmas growing up. And that's this, we make much of ourselves and little of God. Now, coming to our text, for those of you that are new, I think there's a few here, um, we, are, we have been preaching in the book of 1 Samuel for the last two months. And, and what we have read and what we have heard is that Israel, they were just bent. They were bent on rebelling against God. And this was most exemplified in the request for a king. Now, the request for a king wasn't in and of itself inherently evil, but it's what lay behind that request. And that was a rejection of God as their king. And yet, what we find or what we found is that despite their wickedness, God in his mercy and his grace would allow Israel to choose their own king in King Saul. And God would even say to Saul, I I I promise to establish your king forever should you fear me and should you serve me faithfully. And up until this point, the verdict is still out on Saul. We're not too sure whether he is a good or a bad king. And at times, he seems to run away from his duties. And and, and we're not quite sure, is is this guy a good king? Is this guy humble or is this guy not? Other times, he seems quite confident in his position. Seems to be doing what a king should. But now we come to our text in 1 Samuel 13, where we see that actually, Saul was a king in whom did not trust God, did not look to God, and did not make much of him. We see Saul as a king whom rejected God as his king. And so why he did this essentially is because he looked to himself. Didn't look to God, but he made much of himself. 
And so there's two points through our text in which I'm going to unpack to us today. And that's this, looking to ourselves, be it in triumphs, in trials, or in our heart. And secondly, looking at Christ, be it in Him who gives us a new heart, or in trials, or in triumphs. Now, if you have your Bibles, feel free to flick it open. I'm going to f- go through it quite closely. Um, you'll notice in verse 1 that uh, Sh- Sheila wonderfully read that it begins with uh, Saul lived for one year. Now, you may notice that in your Bibles, however, that there's a difference in translation. And part of this quick sidebar is just due to there being ambiguity in the original manuscript as to Saul's age at the time. And so you may see a dot, dot, dot in your verse 1 if you're in, I think, NIV, it may translate it as 40 years or thereabouts. But this is not a material point. What is the main and material point and what um, the writer gets us to focus on is what is Saul's posture as a king? And so we read that Saul, um, the, from verses 1 through to 4, it begins with a victory. Saul leading his people to victory against their longtime nemesis, their longtime enemies, the Philistines. And we just have to be quite alert as to the detail that's recorded, because, or rather, I should say, the detail that's not recorded. Because what we see is that in the announcement of the victory, there's no attribution to God. Now, looking at our verses, you'll see that Jonathan, with his 1,000 men, leads a small garrison up against, or small people up to the Philistine garrison, and he defeats them. And yet what was announced to all the Hebrews, let the Hebrews hear, is that Saul was victorious. But we can't read too much into the victory being attributed to Saul as opposed to Jonathan. Why? Saul's king. And so you would expect as king and as commander that he's going to get attribution in one way or another. But what we can read into, and what is a red flag, is that there's no attribution of God in the victory. Now, this is in stark contrast to 1 Samuel 11, uh, verse 13, which you can see up on the screens, in whereby, having defeated the Ammonites, what does Saul say? He goes, the Lord has worked salvation in Israel. And it's at the very same place in Gilgal. Right? This is a place where Saul was instituted as king. And so one battle on, just one battle on, rather than attribute the victory towards God, what does Saul do? He attributes the victory towards himself. Now what changed? Did he just simply forget? Is this just a detail that the writer admit, uh, decided to admit? I don't think so. I think what changed was that Saul was a person that was looking to himself and wanted all of Israel to look to him. See, Saul, in in wanting to establish his kingdom, is likely keen to maintain his reputation as a king that can vanquish Israel's enemies. And in doing so, he's becoming confident in his abilities. And so with this victory against the Philistines, rather than attribute it to God, he goes, let the Hebrews hear. So he's not even addressing the Philistines, he's addressing the people of Israel. He's saying, let the Hebrews hear that it's Saul, that it's me that was victorious over the Philistines. It is me that vanquished Israel's longtime enemies. Now, if we were to act like Saul, to make much of ourselves amidst our triumphs, not only does it disregard God, but it can also blind us to the fading nature of our victories. What do I mean by this? Well, if we keep on making much of ourselves, if we keep on looking to ourselves in our triumphs, we'll always be faced with the need to do more, but knowing that we can't do it forever. For example, take the GOAT debates. For those of you that are unfamiliar, GOAT stands for greatest of all time. And so me, I, I, I'm an avid fan of basketball, and non, non-stop do you hear debates about who's the GOAT? Uh, LeBron or Jordan? It's Jordan, by the way. LeBron or Jordan? Curry or Magic? Or in soccer, maybe what? Uh, Messi or Ronaldo? But the fundamentally flawed thing about these debates is that they try to pit two people 
from two different eras against one another. It would make much more sense to say who is the greatest of that time and who is the greatest of that time. But we seem so bent on trying to figure out who is the forever best that we would much rather compare a shadow of what people once were as opposed to the reality that they are now. And the truth of the matter is, friends, no one can be the GOAT. No one can be the GOAT forever. Why? Because age and the next generation of up-and-comers are just around the corner. But you see, if we keep on looking to ourselves, if we keep on making much of our triumphs, it blinds us to their fading glory. And friends, unfortunately, what it takes us, what help, what, what, what it takes to help us see otherwise is either trial or death. And this is what happens as we move on into our text. So when we look on, in response to um, Saul's uh, def- defeating of the Philistines, the Philistines respond by coming out in full force. And so Saul's victory, it's short-lived. And how they respond leaves Israel's situation to be desired. Their situation, guys, it, it, it looks bleak. Not only are they outnumbered, as you can see in verses 5 to 7, but the only means for battle in looking at verses 16 to 23 is they've got two guys with swords, and the rest of them, what are they sporting? Farming tools. They can't fight. What are they going to do? And so in response, the Philistines, they they look like they're just going to run over the Israelites. But what is really tragic in how the author describes the situation of the Israelites, is that there's a real irony that, that, um, that is being detailed. You see, the Philistines, uh, as you can read in verse, verse 5, they number, they're in number as those of sand on the seashore in multitude. This is Abrahamic language. This is language that was promised to the descendants of the Israelites. This is how the Israelites should be, as numbered as sand on the seashore. And to make matters even worse, what we see is that the Israelites, they're described as if God's enemy, as if receiving God's judgment. And so we see that they're what? They're hiding in caves, in holes, and in rocks, and even in tombs and in cisterns. And you see elsewhere in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament, when God judges, when God delivers His judgment, people flee. And how do they flee? By hiding caves, rocks, and holes. And so what's going on here is that the Philistines, they're prospering. They're prospering as if God's people. Whereas the Israelites, they're languishing. And they're about to perish as if God's enemies. But the most sad thing about this all is that Israel, the the people still didn't cry out to God. They still refused to cry out to God. The God who said in just chapter 12, verse 22, if you're near there, that the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, not ours. And that it has pleased the Lord, it has pleased God to make Israel a people for himself. And so rather than look to this promise, Israel chose to forget it. Why? Because they had rejected their identity as God's people. They had forgot that they were a people of God. And you see, trials, just like for the Israelites and for us today, they can have a way about us which makes us forget as Christians that we are God's people. See, when when trials come, the instinctual urge is to respond to the trials by often looking to myself. I, I, I'm sorry, looking, looking to ourselves. I do this all the time. When a trial comes, I look to myself to solve the problem. I grieve over it, and then I go, what do I need to do? 
I don't cry out to God. I look to myself. But we, he, we read here that God says, I will not forsake you. And so he bids us then to cry out to him, to act like he will not forsake us, to call upon his faithfulness, not ours. But unfortunately, we see that Saul's unwillingness to do so, his repeat and Israelite and leading his people to, to not cry out to God, it shows that Saul, he was never God's king to begin with. And so moving on into our text, verse 7 and 8, we see that the people, they're in Gilgal, they're trembling, they're looking to Saul. Rather than looking to God, they're looking to Saul. What should we do? Saul, you're the king. You're the king we chose. What do we do? Now, Gilgal, it's a significant place. For one, as I read earlier in chapter 11, it's a place where Saul was instituted as king, and it's a place where God worked salvation in Israel, where God led Israel to defeat the Ammonites. But also, it's a place that was revered in Israel's history. It's a place where um, God caused the Jordan River to dry up so that the people of Israel could cross it in, in, on, on dry ground. And so rather than, as we see, like fleeing and crossing the fords, the people of Israel back then, they could walk across the Jordan River on dry ground, very much akin to like Moses parting the Red Sea. And why did God do this? It was a precursor for them to enter the promised land, whereby God, as their king, as the Israelites' king, would lead them into battle against the nations, thereby claiming their um, promised land just as God had promised them. And knowing that his people, that the Israelites were, were very likely to forget what God had done, you can read in Joshua 4 and 5, 4, I think, that God commands the Israelites to set up 12 stones in Gilgal, one for each tribe of Israel, a reminder for the people of Israel to remember what God had done and who he had done it for, that God had delivered his people, that God had saved his people. And so fast forward to Saul's day, it's fairly safe to assume that those 12 stones, they, they probably still stood there. A reminder for Saul and the Israelites to look to, to look to their God, to look to the God who saves them, to look to the God that delivers them. But did they do this? Saul, rather than look to his God who had saved him, to his God that had delivered him and his people time and time and time and time again, he looks to himself. He rejects God and he takes matters into his own hands. And we read that upon seeing the people flee, what does Saul do? He makes a burnt offering. Just, just as Samuel arrives. And Samuel calls out to him, Saul, what have you done? Now this is some commentators suggest this is akin to the garden where Adam, after having taken the fruit, um, God calls out, what have you done? And so this question by Samuel, as God's prophet, what have you done, should be seen in the light of um, an invitation to repent. Because Samuel obviously knows what Saul's done. He's seen that Saul's made the offering. He can just see it right there. He's arrived, right? And so he's asking, Saul, what have you done? Repent. Turn away from your wrongdoings. Admit your wrong and declare to God that you need him, that you need God to help you. But how does Saul instead respond? He justifies his actions. He even goes to blame Samuel. He, he says, you are late. Samuel, don't you know my situation? I've got a sword. Sure, my son has a sword, but the rest of these guys, what do they got? They've got axes. They've got plows. We're dealing with hundreds and thousands of Philistines. Isn't it justifiable for me to go out and to seek God's favor by making the offering? Right? Seems logical, right? I mean, I look at this and I'm like, he's got a good point. 
But what we read, unfortunately, in verse 12, is that at a superficial level, whilst his actions may have seemed good, may have been justifiable, we see a heart that was not looking at God all this time. We see a heart that was looking at God as someone to do his bidding, someone to do Saul's work. He treated God like an object. He didn't treat God as someone to revere, someone to worship, someone to have a relationship with, someone who loved him and who he is to love back. No. What did he do? He forced himself. We read in verse 12, Saul forced himself to make the offering. He didn't want to. He only did it out of necessity. He only did it as a means to do his work. He saw the Philistines were going to come up against him, and he's like, if I want to get my way, if I want to see my end, I'm going to make God do it for me. He treated God as a means to an end, an object even. And so what we see is that Saul had no issue. He had no issue breaking God's command. Why? Because he didn't look to God as his God. And Samuel responds to this as God's prophet, and he says, Saul, this is foolish. We read earlier that God had even promised to Saul that he would establish his kingdom. He would make it a forever kingdom. God would do the work. Saul just had to trust in it. But he didn't. Why? Because he was never looking to God. He was looking to himself. And, and we see, unfortunately, this pattern in Saul's life. Whereas earlier on in 1 Samuel, you see Saul almost humbly, but not really, like fleeing away from his responsibilities as king, seeing himself as being inferior to the role of being able to lead um, God's people, the Israelites as king, not doing his duty as a king, Una feeling as though he was unable to meet the expectations. But now, what do we see? We saw Saul abusing his power as king, viewing the role as Israel's king as beneath him, and therefore extending, doing what a king shouldn't do, reaching further than what a king should do. And whilst these views of Saul's self by looking to himself seem seemingly contradictory, actually, guys, it points to the same heart issue, a heart that doesn't look to God but looks to himself. Saul did not look to God. He looked to himself. And friends, we've got to ask ourselves, who are we looking at today? You know, when we keep on looking to ourselves, our view of self, it, it, it becomes twisted. We'll either feel compelled to work from a place of superiority, always feeling the need to be better than others, always striving but never feeling that we can do good enough, always needing a better lifestyle, a better home, a better car, a better job than those around us. And yet, strangely, when we keep on viewing ourselves through this lens, we'll, always be, we'll also be viewing ourselves through this lens of inferiority, knowing that we need to do more in order to be better, but knowing eventually that we're never going to be good enough, that we're never going to be good enough for our bosses, we're never going to be good enough for our parents, we're never going to be good enough for our kids. And the reality is, is that when we keep on looking to ourselves, we'll have to contend with this truth, that we don't like what we see. And yet, friends, God sees us. He sees our hearts. And he sought out to set his heart upon us. Moving on into verse 14, which I'll just read for us. Upon declaring that um, Saul's kingdom is going to end, the prophet Samuel says, the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be a prince over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Now, 
in reading this verse, the emphasis should be actually on the Lord has sought. The Lord has sought. Why, why this part? Because actually it's supposed to be pitted against Israel choosing their own king. And so this is God's king. The Lord has sought out a king of his own choosing as opposed to Israel having chosen his own king, their own king. And why did God need to choose his own king? Why couldn't he just let Israel choose their king? It's because we're all souls. We all will look to ourselves because we have made ourselves king. And we see God as someone or as something even to do our bidding, to do our kingdom, uh, to do our work in our kingdom. And, and, and God, friends, he, he sees our hearts. He sees we do not look to him. And he has every right to treat us like his enemies, to judge us and condemn us as such. But we see that God sought out a king who would keep God's commands in our place. God sought out a king that would keep God's commands in our place. And we see a shadow of this in David, which we'll hear of later as we go through 1 Samuel, but we ultimately see this king in Jesus. Friends, Jesus is the king after God's own heart. Jesus is a faithful king. He is a king who was surrounded by enemies, who was abandoned by his people. He was a king in whom was left alone, even by God himself at the cross. He was forsaken by God. And yet, Jesus, as a man after God's own heart, and as we read, as Lenin read earlier, Jesus is a king who for the joy that was set before him, he continued to look towards God. He continued to obey him. He continued to trust in him. Jesus is the king that did not stop looking towards God, even when he was forsaken. And yet Jesus, at the right time, he gave himself up as a sacrifice for our sins. Jesus is the faithful king who is the founder and the perfecter of our faith. Jesus is a faithful king who gives us a new heart, a heart that looks to him. And friends, if you have not yet put your faith in Jesus, but you are just tired, you are tired of constantly looking to yourself, always feeling like you need to do more, but feeling as though you'll never be good enough, Friends, it doesn't have to be so if you just look to Jesus. Because you see, at, at the cross, we see who we truly are. And, and, and what we see is this, that we are more wicked, more poor and depraved than we could ever have imagined. And yet, we are more loved, we are more rich, and we are more blessed than we could have ever have hoped for. Friends, who we are, it, it isn't conditional. It isn't circumstantial. It isn't based on what we can or what we can't do. It isn't based on our merit. It's based on Jesus. Who we are is who God says we are. And this is eternal. It does not change. Who we are is who God says we are. And who we are, he has shown us in Jesus. Friends, it is in Jesus that God reveals us to ourselves. So, how do we look to Jesus? We can look to Jesus in trials. And just a quick sidebar here. In looking at Jesus in trials, we have to be careful to guard against a religiosity that is blind towards God. Consider Saul, for example. On face value, again, he seems to be quite the pious man, right? Makes sacrifices, he superficially obeys God's command, doesn't want to do wrong by God. But as we kind of read and as we exposed, when you kind of looked past that religious veneer, what we see is a heart that did not love God, a heart that did not worship Him, 
but a heart that was looking to ourselves. And so we can, we can, friends, we can come to church every week, we can read our Bibles daily, we can tithe regularly, perhaps we could even pray. And yet amidst all this activity, we can do so without even looking to God. But looking simply to God as someone to do our bidding in our work, in our kingdom. We can look to God, as we heard earlier on in this year, as a philosophy, not a person. And yet, as we read earlier, God is a God who does not forsake His people. God is our loving Father. And He longs, He longs to embrace us as such. He longs for us to come to Him and to know that He is our Father and that we are His people. And so amidst trials, we can cry out to Him. We can cry out to our loving Father who begs us, who bids us to cry out to Him. And we can expect Him to hear. And so, how do we know if we're looking to Christ amidst trials? Or how do we know if we're looking to Christ? We can ask ourselves, how would we respond amidst trials? And uh, to do the, I often, you might think this is silly, but I often ask myself this question, uh, or, or play out these hypothetical scenarios. And so, like, my wife and, and my family, we've been in Singapore for five years now. And um, I've, we primarily came here for myself to serve at ROTC, and we've deeply loved it here. We, we, we've really loved um, that God has given us the opportunity to serve His church in this way. And yet one question I always try to ask myself is, God, how would I respond to you if we were forced to go back to Australia? Amidst all that we've invested in, amidst all that we've sacrificed, how would I respond to you if we had to go back? Would I bless you or would I revile you? And I know often at times in my heart, when I've asked myself this question, I know my response is one that it would be angry and bitter towards God if that were to happen. I just know it. And what it shows me is that as, as pious and great as the work may be, serving His church, His people, it shows me that I'm looking at the work I'm not looking at God. And so it's in those instances where I've just got to ask God, and I've asked God, God, can you just help me? I, I know I can't change my own heart, but you can. Lord, can you help me look to you? Can you help me trust in you? Can you help me know that come what may, come what trial may um, bring, can you just help me know that you love me, that you will never forsake me, and that you have shown me this, in Jesus. How would you respond to such a trial? In fact, friend, you, you may be going through one right now and one which um, is, is, is far worse than I can ever hypothetically propose and, and that just grieves me to hear. But God wants you to know that every trial it's an opportunity to locate and affirm our identity in Him. Every trial is an opportunity for you to know that Jesus loves you, that He will not forsake you, He will not abandon you. It has pleased Him to make you a people for Himself, and it brings Him much joy and delight to do so. And so amidst your trials, amidst your difficulties, as heinous and as wicked as they may be, know that no one or nothing can separate you from God's love. It is eternal and it is secure. And so therefore, we can cry out to Him, we can trust in Him, and we can wait for Him to respond. But not in a fatalistic manner, but in a manner that expects Him to show us that He is our God and we are His people. Corey um, Ten Boom was a Christian Dutch watchmaker during World War II. And her and her family, um, what they did was uh, they opened up their home to Jewish um, refugees who were seeking or fleeing from Nazi persecution occupation. And uh, they, they, they did some amazing work. And unfortunately, however, their work would eventually catch the eyes of the Gestapo. And so Corey, um, her father, her sister, and a nephew would be all sent 
to concentration camps. And the accounts of her life um, hiding Jewish refugees, as well as her time in prison, was written in this book called The Hiding Place, which I just strongly recommend you guys read. Um, and, but what would surprise you is that littered throughout these pages is not someone who was blindly confident, someone who was a pillar of faith. What was written throughout and what was contained therein is someone who was constantly struggling, constantly wrestling with God, even at times doubting whether God would deliver them from their evil. And yet, what Corey would come to see, even after the passing of a sister, the passing of a father, the passing of a nephew she later learned, all in concentration camps, Corey would come to see that God's love endures forever, even beyond death. And our hope is, is, is not dependent on our faithfulness. It's dependent on Jesus's. Our hope amidst trials is not dependent on us. It's dependent on Jesus. And so amidst trials, we can cry out to him and we can trust in his word and we can ask him to help us to see that he is with us. Betsy, Betsy Ten Boom, Corey's sister, um, had a very weak disposition and, and she would find herself um, in the concentration camp having line, to line up at the hospital and amidst um, death and disease and sickness and seeing even people before them in the queue just drop. Betsy would say, we must tell them that there is no pit so deep that God is not deeper still. Betsy would die a few weeks later at that very same concentration camp, at that very same hospital. And yet not someone as who had succumbed to her trial, but as someone who was triumphant, even in death. And what we can learn, what truth we can learn from this, friends, is that God's people are victorious and blessed people. Saul struggled to see this, Israel struggled to see this, and friends, perhaps speaking on behalf of us all, I know I struggled to see this. We struggle to believe in God's goodness towards us, particularly in trial. And yet, as we'll see in, in, in later in 1 Samuel, God delivers, He delivers Israel in the very next chapter from the Philistines through the faithful son, Jonathan, who actually points to Jesus. And so why, I suspect, why we, we struggle to believe that God calls us a victorious and blessed people is we don't see eye to eye with God on what it means to be triumphant. We define triumph in, in worldly and temporal terms. At the top of our game, top of the corporate ladder, relationally secure, financially set. This is what it means to be triumphant. But what we see, friends, it's only in the gospel that we can be truly triumphant. Because it's in the gospel that even when we're the most weak, even when we're the most poor and depraved, we can boast in the power of Jesus Christ who has overcome the grave, the power of Jesus Christ which allows us to, to declare that we are more than conquerors. We can boast in Jesus, in our weakness, because of his power which is made perfect in and through us. And secondly, it's in the gospel that we see triumph because we find that our hope, our triumphs aren't to be found in this world. But our hope and our victory is to be found in the kingdom that is to come. And that kingdom, friends, it is ours now and it is ours forever. No one and nothing can take that away. And so we can, we can enjoy our worldly triumphs, though. But in their rightful place, things in which, yes, are to be not dismissed, are to be presently enjoyed, but are things in which are given to us by our gracious Father and things that we know will not last forever, but are just simply a shadow or a sign of the things to come. 
And the point is with all this, whether in triumph or whether in trial, we can look to Christ who makes our joy complete. And so, friends, I, I don't know where you are at, at the moment in life, whether you are experiencing triumph or trial or either one or both, perhaps, depending on the time of day. But I want you to know that God knows. God knows your situation. And in the midst of your situation, He wants you to look to Him. But if you are struggling to look to God on your own accord, or if you don't even know yet where to begin, friends, you don't have to do this alone. God in His gracious provision has given us one another to help each other, point each other towards Christ. And so if that's you, friends, we'll have some people here um, who will gladly pray with you after service, myself included, to help pray into your triumph, to pray into your trial, and together to look to Christ. And so friends, don't hesitate. If that's you, do come up. Do allow us to together look to Christ. In closing, friends, Christ, he, he came into this world. The faithful king who triumphed over trial. That wherever we may find ourselves, we might look to him and make much of him. Let me pray for us. Father, we, we ask you, Lord, that you would help us look to you this morning to behold you, to be captivated by you, Lord. Forgive us for the times where amidst all that life throws at us that we, we look to ourselves that we doubt your goodness, we doubt your sovereignty, we doubt your faithfulness. But Lord, we thank you that you've proven yourself time and time again, that you are good, and we see that ultimately in the person and the work of Jesus, who has been with us, who is with us now, and who will be with us forever. And so I pray for myself and my brothers and sisters here this morning, Lord, that through your Spirit, Holy Spirit, won't you help us just look to you? And won't you help us show that you are our God and we are your people? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.